It is my great pleasure today to introduce our invited speaker to the HEAS Archaeological Site, Dr. Dennis Wilken from Christian Albrechts University in Kiel in Germany. Dr. Wilken is an internationally leading expert on shallow marine geophysics applied to geoarchaeological prospection. Dennis studied physics um, and the intriguing subject of white dwarf stars at Kiel University. He earned his PhD in geophysics, innovatively exploring the application of swarm intelligence optimization to the dispersion adjustment of seismic Schulte waves, shedding light on shallow marine sediments and sea wave velocities. I think I have to mute that a little bit here, not to get feedback. Throughout his career, Dr. Wilken has distinguished himself by merging the fields of near-surface geophysics and archaeology, advancing and applying a diverse range of prospection methods with a focus on the exploration of shallow marine, lacustrine, and intertidal areas. From the discovery of the long-sought Temple of Poseidon in Samicon in Greece and the exploration of chamber graves at Olympia, uh, to mapping the ancient harbor bay of Kane in Turkey, to searching harbors in Greenland and on Iceland. He has pioneered and led the use of specially adapted magnetometry, geoelectrics, multi-coil electromagnetic induction, and ground penetrating radar measurements, as well as terrestrial and marine seismics and substantially advanced geophysical high-resolution data processing and inversion methods to uncover the remnants of human history submerged beneath water. Not or intertidal zones. His highly remarkable geoarchaeological work in the discovery and analysis of the drowned medieval city of Rungholt employed a variety of geophysical techniques to reveal settlement patterns in a very challenging environment, as you will see today under mudflats, providing a, lie, a window into the life of North Frisian settlers. And today he will talk to us on ships, harbors, and waterways, geophysical prospection in shallow waters and tidal flats, drawing upon his extensive background in both the theoretical and practical aspects of geophysics. He will share insights into the challenges and triumphs of exploring underwater and intertidal archaeological sites. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Imo. Thank you for the uh, nice introduction. And uh, thank you for having me here, for inviting me to Vienna. I'm very pleased to give a talk here in Vienna because I love the city and I love the work that you are doing here. And uh, I hope we connect more into detail, more deeper in the next few years of research in submarine prospection. But uh, today I would like to give you an overview on, okay, that's what you said, space first, no. On technical issues, yes. <laughs> Maybe I can simply use the mouse. Okay, so we solve this issue. Uh, I would like to give you an overview on the prospection of ships, harbors, and waterways. Kiel had a long tradition in, well, marine prospection due to a project running six years that was the SPP harbor project funded by the DFG. And most of the examples that I show you today are from this project and others. Uh, here in the background, you see uh, us doing side scan sonar and seismic reflections in Greenland, which was one of the loveliest places I've ever been. Um, the outline of my talk looks like this. So the whole thing is about what does it mean to prospect ships, harbors, and waterways in terms of archaeological prospection. And of course, because it's the most interesting part for me and for you probably as well, we will start with uh, ships. And I will talk about the methodology, the problem of uh, contrast and state of preservation of ships, the problem of wood being preserved underwater, or in the sediment and uh, coming to high demands on spatial resolution of geophysical methods. 
And then I will present you some solutions to that problem and some examples. And those ships usually end up or start in harbors, which is then the next topic. And those harbors are usually located at waterways or waters. And then we talk about harbor structures. What does it mean? Is it a landing site or is it an indirect harbor? Uh, or is it a structural thing, anthropogenic structures of uh, harbor infrastructure? You will never know what you are prospecting whether it's landscape or anthropogenic structures or both. And that's why we need methods that can give us both. And uh, I will talk about that. I will talk about imaging silted up waterways, um, silted up and shifted waterways, artificial waterways. There's one example. And then the problem of this near coastal prospection is the lack of proper depth resolving methods in such silted up lagoonal um, environments and coastal areas. Okay, so starting with ships. Um, of course, I'm coming from Kiel. My example must be a Viking Age ship or reconstruction of a Viking Age ship. Um, we will come back to that example later. We all know, because you have been attending, for example, Professor Renby's talk as well, we all know examples like these. Multi-beam and side-scan sonar data of wonderful shipwrecks not submerged, but on the subsurface of lakes, of rivers, of, uh, well, seas. And we have seen the ghost ship in the middle by uh, Professor Rönnby. You have probably seen the, the load of a former Byzantine ship by Robert Ballard on the left and some modern ships. They are usually um, well located and prospected by side scan sonar. And I'm not sure if I have to explain how multi-beam and side scan sonar works. I think not. If so, please tell me. Okay, so it's simply mapping the seafloor in different methods. So those examples are intriguing and, and interesting, but they are exceptional. If you're dealing with the prospection of wrecks, you usually have examples like this. We have, uh, we can find in literature, for example, this is an example from Hedeby by Müller et al, 2013, where you have this, well, dark dot that is a ship. Trust me, there have been divers going there, checking it. It is a ship, it is a Viking Age ship, but the only thing you see in a very sophisticated 3D seismic uh, image is a dot. Well, it's an elongated dot, at least. And then we have uh, examples from uh, Ruth Platz in 2010. She used multi-beam and imaged such examples. So there are some rips coming out of the sediment. And it's not that intriguing as the examples before. And uh, me as well, I was uh, able to image some examples. This is from the Fardov wreck that we see later on. It's very thin layer of wood on the sur subsurface. And then there's an example of a 17th century wreckage from the North Sea. This is tidal flat uh, archaeological prospection. So make it short. What we have, we usually have destroyed wrecks. Again, an example from uh, Professor Rönnby here. So dissembled parts of ships, a very thin layer of wood. They are destroyed. We have only a few parts, not the whole ship. We have a poor state of preservation due to marine fauna. If you have ship warms, coming in, destroying this, uh, the wooden remains. And uh, of course, we have wrecks and wreckage, which are mostly covered by sediments. So we need to go beyond the sonar mapping of the seafloor. And we have extremes in water depth. We have very deep water, which is a problem in terms of seismic resolution, as I will explain later on. And we have the very shallow water, where the ships land, where the ships come to the harbors. We have very shallow water, which is down to half a meter or less in some examples. So we have to deal with these problems. And uh, so the question that we have to pose is what is needed to achieve a useful spatial resolution and subsoil penetration to prospect ships in a first attempt? Any technical issues? Okay, it is, that's the right one, yeah, it's nearly max, better now? Okay, so what is needed to achieve useful spatial resolution and subsoil penetration? And the answer to that is, of course, sediment echo sounders and seismics. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a sketch how that works. 
the sediment echo sounders are usually sending out a signal that penetrates through the water column and into the sediments, reflections coming back and received by the transducers or hydrophones. The distinguishing between seismics and sediment echo sounder is not useful, if you ask me. It's all seismics. It's not hydroacoustics. It is hydroacoustics as long as you stay in the water column. As soon as you get into the sediment, it's seismics. And um, you all might know these typical kind of seismics. You have a source and the hydrophone, usually separated. You have several hydrophones, and there are a lot of systems that are that have been specially developed for archaeological prospection. The uh, first one in literature that I would like to mention is the one from the colleagues from Southampton. Here's a picture from Butowski et al. in 2008. They have a large frame with, I think, about 60 hydrophones in there. So there are these tubes with all the hydrophones connected. They have several GPS. The system was later on bought by Kongsberg and used for UXO prospection. And this is this image. This is how it looks like. It has a chirp source in the middle. And here I have provided you some uh, sketches on the geometry of the system. You have a source in the middle and you have hydrophones on the sides, back and forth, and both sides left and right. And this is the coverage of the seafloor that you get in the subsoil. And then, of course, you have the uh, technical solution by Inuma. They have a very nice um, parametric echo sounder, which they now sell in multiple sources and receivers, which is uh, called Quadro. I think they actually have an octo that they sell. This is the Quadro. The geometry is quite simple. You have the source and receiver in the transducer itself, and then signal is going down. So the width of your measurement area is equal to the width of your array. And then uh, we also played around a bit in Kiel, and what we came up with is this so-called ping pong system, which has two sources, left and right, and they are used um, one after another. So you get the same coverage than your array size. It is a bit a copy and paste from the Malamira GPR system. So we have 1.5 meters in width and uh, 15 centimeters spatial resolution on the ground. So I will, of course, show you some examples from this system here uh, and also a comparison from this. So there are some systems available. The question is, what resolution do they have? And now I have to bother you a bit with a theoretical background, but only a few slides. In terms uh, of seismic resolution, it's quite simple to get the vertical resolution. So if you're sounding vertically downwards, your resolution is one fourth of the wavelength. And the wavelength, that's something you can calculate from your frequency and your velocity of propagation. And that is if you're working in water very easy, because the water velocity is usually constant, 1,500 meters per second, plus minus a bit, depending on temperature, salinity, and stuff, but it's roughly constant. In waters, you have don't have the problem like in uh, land seismic that you have a large uh, damping of the waves. The damping is very low, so you can freely choose your frequency. And that's the benefit of marine prospection. You can go from a few hertz up to dozens of kilohertz, depending on what you want to prospect. And I chose two frequencies, and you can calculate this uh, one-fourth of the wavelength for 15 kilohertz, with this, to my knowledge, the max frequency or the max low frequency of the uh, Enuma SES device. And you end up with a resolution in vertical by 0 0.025 meters, which is 2.5 centimeters, which is nice for archaeology. But let's keep in mind this is theoretical. We'll come to, back to that later. The ping pong system that we use is the other edge. It's a four kilohertz system and you end up with a vertical resolution of 0.1 meter, which is also sufficient so far. The problem is so not the vertical resolution. You can simply choose it. The problem is the horizontal resolution. And uh, the horizontal resolution is determined by the so-called Fresnel zone, which is basically the zone of reflection points. So you have your source and receiver over here, and then you have your water column, and then you have the seafloor, for example. And every point in this area here reflect the outgoing signal back to the detector. And all these points in this zone that is depicted here from here to here 
all these points cannot be distinguished in terms of the seismic signal. So they are in a time range of a time range distance of one quarter of a wavelength. So you get simply a mix up of all this stuff down here. And the width of this Fresnel zone is dependent on depth. And that's what's making marine prospection so difficult. This accounts as well for GPR, and you probably know this already. But the width of this zone is dependent on the depth. And if we think of one of the first slides where I said, OK, depth, extreme depth are a problem. For example, if you go in deep waters a few hundred meters and you use an echo sounder, you will end up with a very large footprint of your single channel system. So this is, um, let's say, a physical problem, but the good thing is that can be solved as well. I've made um, this slide for you to illustrate the size of this Fresnel zone, depending on depth. On the left-hand side, you see the depth. I chose one, uh, 0 to 10 meters water depth, which is kind of realistic in terms of archaeological prospection in small waters. And for frequencies, 20 kilohertz down to 4 kilohertz. And these areas that you see here is the Fresnel zone. So if you use 4 kilohertz with a theoretical vertical resolution of 0.1 meters, the width of the Fresnel zone, so the resolution in 10 meters depth, is nearly 3 meters. And this is not suitable for archaeological prospection. And the same accounts for higher frequencies, as you see here. This is more than one meter. The dashed line is the technical solution of Inomar. They have a very narrow beam of the source. And this is uh, the 3 dB down point, I guess. And it's an opening angle of 6 degrees. And this is the dashed line here. So I added that to show you how a technical solution could look like. And then I used one of my examples from the Wadden Sea. This is this wreckage part of the uh, 17th century shipwreck. And I simply plotted the top of these Fresnel zones on this wreckage part. And you see them here. So this is a top view of the Fresnel zones and the size of the Fresnel zones. And you see, for all examples, all frequencies, this is not working in terms of archaeological prospection. Even the technical solution of Inomar is not working properly in 10 meters depth. So the solution is quite simple. You have to do 3D seismic imaging. 3D imaging uh, is something that we also do in GPR. Alois knows, knows best. And uh, we also need to do that in marine seismic prospection. But the drawback of this is that the data needs to be sampled according to Nucris criterion. So the measurement points need to be as dense as one half of the wavelength in a spatial view. That means for 15 kilohertz, you need to have a spatial coverage of, well, five centimeters. And this is technically not realistic. But it also works for lower frequencies. And that's why we choose for our system the 4 kilohertz version, because 4 kilohertz gets you a reasonable vertical resolution. And it gets you half a wavelength of 18 centimeters. And then you are able to technically cover a 3D data cube. And then if you migrate the data, you will end up with, it's hard to find, but this small dot here for the 20 kilohertz example, which is theoretical a feasible resolution for archaeological prospection in the submarine. OK, I hope I did not bore you too much. I uh, selected an example from two weeks ago to illustrate this uh, uh, resolution effect. This is a side scan sonar image of a tree at uh, about six meters depth in a lake in Poland, which I uh, recorded two weeks ago. And it's very nicely imaged, this tree. You have the branches and everything, not the leaves. This is too small, but uh, the branches. And uh, this is um, a good image with a very simple side scan. And then you have a 3D data set by this 4 kilohertz system below of the same tree. Uh, it looks, well, not that convincing, but you see branches which for me was a, was a surprise and was the first time that I can test the uh, actual, not theoretical, but the achieved resolution of this system on an object 
that I have imaged in a, uh, yeah, let's say, more feasible manner using the sonar. So you have the branches, you can simply follow the resolution and see where it stops. This is, of course, a bit squeezed because it's side scan sonar, so it's stretched to the side. Um, this is the, the real size of the tree, and you have the two branches over here, which are this and this. And then I, because I do not have an SES Quattro system, I simply selected an example from the Inuma homepage, which is here, which is one of the uh, well-known examples of that company. It's the Viking HC barrier close to Hedeby, where you have wooden boxes of five meters diameter, and you can simply stretch it to this, to this scale here, and you can compare the resolution of both systems. So the technical resolution actually works also quite well. And it tells us that even we do, even though we do uh, 3D seismic imaging, we end up with a practical resolution, not the theoretical. It's even worse than the theoretical. But I think this example of the tree and the branches that we see shows us that these kind of methods are able to image archaeological features. Not in the resolution or as a surface sonars are able to, but in a reasonable, uh, with a reasonable resolution size. So, so far the problems of uh, marine prospection using seismics and the solutions to that, and now some examples that uh, I've collected during the past years. And the first one is a shipwreck, a known shipwreck from the harbor of Putsk in Poland, close to Dansk. And uh, the harbor is situated here. And it's a very large harbor system. It's a very unique uh, site. We see some examples later on as well in the multi-beam uh, data set that we've collected. But now I simply chose the one known wreck. There was a wreck excavated uh, on a similar site with a, uh, from a similar time frame. So it looks like this. This is a reconstruction that was used. And on the left-hand side, you see a time slice of this uh, 3D system, a migrated time slice. And what you can see is the solid lines indicate the geological background that is imaged by the system. And here is the shape of this wreck. So it's a bit blurry, but you can outline a ship, which was the first example of this system that we were able to uh, image. And here you have a cross section of this ship and you see the the form of the ship, which quite nicely uh, resembles the example from the other side. So this was our first example. I think Imo can remember because I showed it on one of our first presentations in the SPP seminars. And uh, from that day on, we collected a few more examples of shipwrecks. This one is the so-called Fardorf wreck, simply named after the village nearby. It is here close to Hedeby and Schleswig. So this is the Schleifjord in Northern Germany. I'm coming from here. And um, the wreck was found by a fisher who simply dragged some, some wooden pieces with his net out of the water and then called the archeological state office. And then we went there as well as a diver group. The diver group did um, structure from motion images with the camera very close to the surface because they uh, the vision was very bad in the Schlei, and they end up with these 3D images of the remains. So what you have is only a few parts of the ship that are still there, and you have the keel over here, which disappeared, so it's simply dashed lines here, and you have one side of the ship, which is still present there. And then we went there with this uh, 3D system, and here are some examples of this wreck. On top left, you see time slices at different depths. We have this banana-shaped object, which is easily uh, distinguishable from the background. And if you put some vertical profiles through them, you end up with these images. This is uh, alongside the ship. You see the seafloor and below a very thin layer of this ship remain. And you also have uh, cross sections in this direction, and you can see the orientation of the shipwreck. So what you, what you have here is not the whole hull of the ship. It's simply a part of a tilted ship 
which was not eroded or eaten up by ship warms. This is a 3D cube of the ship. And uh, we were quite lucky to uh, get a wreck of the 12th century in this resolution. And we were even more lucky because um, we were able to compare it with the Inuma Quattro data set, which I will show you the next slide. But one more um, thing to be mentioned in terms of seismics and seismic prospection. You have seen before in the vertical cross section that the ship layer, the wooden layer, is very thin. It's only a few centimeters thick, as you see here. And it's very close to the seafloor. So to be able to distinguish this wooden reflection layer from the seafloor, you need a very good vertical resolution. We know that the system has 0.1 theoretical resolution, but this is not always achieved. Why? because you have reverberations of the system, you have reverberations of the sources, so the signal is quite long. This is one example of the reflection signal. So this reflection from the wooden parts of the wreck are somewhere in here, a mix up of the seafloor and the reflection of the shipwreck. So we need to reduce the, way, the length of the signal because the length of the signal determines the actual achieved resolution. So what you have to do is seismic deconvolution, which is one of the processing methods that is commonly applied in seismics and land seismics and everywhere. You use seismics and it's also needed in archaeological prospection to get the signal length a bit shorter to be able to visualize and resolve these thin layers. Because these wrecks, this example is typical for wrecks of this time and also other times. It's always a very thin layer of wooden remains buried under the seafloor or on top of the seafloor. So this is a very crucial part of seismic processing, the deconvolution. And then you end up with these time slices that I've shown you before. And here is a quite rare comparison of a 3D seismic system and the technical 3D solution of the SOS Quattro system. And you see, they both have a banana, which is, let's say, comparable. There are a few details, which of course depend, uh, as you all know, on color scales and how you show which thickness of the time slices you show. I, I wasn't able to get the data set from Inuma, um, so I relied on, on the figures that I can find online on their webpage but I was able to change our 3D data cube, of course. So you have this thin line here, which is the keel of the ship. You have the banana, which is the side, the tilted side of the ship on, and the, the layer of wood, of hull wood that we see here. So it's comparable and that's a good thing. That means that we are able to go deeper. If we use 3D seismics, we are able to go to deeper sites using 3D migration to image such wrecks also at deeper sites. Um, the next question is the state of preservation. There are nice works by Stephanie Arnott in 2005. She uh, used archaeological wood in different stages of degradation and checked for the reflection coefficient in seismics. That means you have a decreasing reflection coefficient, which is shown here. So the reflected wave is weaker, the more degraded the uh, wood is. And as you might know, degraded wood is kind of a very a spongy thing. So to have a stiffness contrast or a large reflection coefficient is not very common. So we have the problem that we have low contrast. So how to deal with that? What are we doing in geophysics if there's no contrast? We use different methods. That's the usual way. And it also accounts for uh, the submarine prospection of wooden artifacts. Here's an example from Hedeby, another Viking ship, which is uh, coming from this um, diver web page, the highendarchaeology.eu. Uh, I accidentally stumbled upon this web page. It's very interesting to visit. And they say that this wreck number three, it's numbered by the Archaeological State Department, Wreck number three is the best preserved wreck of Viking Age culture in situ. 
okay, that might be. How does it look from the seismic view? So I went there with a system and tried to image that wreck, and I ended up with this. Okay, you see this nice reflection crossing of the bay reflection, and then here should be the wreck. Now, this is a very thin time slice, and I was only able to image the wreck in this one time slice. So it's also, again, a very thin layer of wood, probably, and it's barely visible. So in seismic, this is not the best preserved wreck in the Viking culture, which is a problem. So we went further on in the uh, Hedebia Noor, trying to image some other Viking wrecks there because there must be a lot. And we found another one, looks like this, not very convincing. Um, so the question is, what can we do? And what we can do is use other methods. There was a work by one of our PhD students, Anika Fidiuk. She checked uh, the contrast of wooden remains, different, differently saturated wooden remains in different uh, geophysical methods. This is seismics, the reflection coefficient of seismics, and GPR, because in freshwater you could also use GPR, having the same problems according to the Fresnel zone. Um, and you could also use something that is, well, sensitive to the electrical properties, uh, conductivity. And what she found is that this conductivity contrast is highest for this kind of woods typical construction woods. So it's worth thinking of having systems that are able to image electric conductivity. Unfortunately, these systems are not available so far. So there's work to do for the future, but um, we were lucky to have this area of tidal flats where we were working, trying to look for the sunken city of Ungholt, and we found some different other things, including wreckages and wrecks. And we were able to test uh, different systems um, on these wreckage parts. You all know this. I chose that for the Fresnel zone examples. And then we measured uh, on top of this wreckage. This is how it looked like in the field. So it was slightly cropping out of the sand. This is after excavation. So we went with a CMD Mini Explorer, an EMI device mapping conductivity and, uh, well, something like... Uh, magnetic susceptibility. Here's a map, and you see the wreckage quite nicely imaged in this example. You can create a cross section. That's a good thing on this method that you can do inversion, get cross sections, and uh, where well, the resolution is poor compared to seismics, of course. But actually, there is something in the data, something that we can visualize, and we also get some rough information on cross sections of these objects. So there are possibilities that we can investigate further. There are also submarine magnetometers. So we chose to use um, magnetic radiometry on another example wreck in the tidal flats of the North Sea. You can see it in the uh, aerial photo over here. This is one side of a 19th century galliot, a Dutch vessel type which usually looks like this, the merchant vessel. And then we did magnetometry covering that wreck and uh, were able to image it in a way, let's say. Um, here, we also tried EMI, but it's not very convincing. So we have to use different methods also in the submarine domain. Uh, one last example of a shipwreck. This is a uh, presumably British Shona, looking like, like this here. It's the HMS city of Bedford. That's how it's said. I've checked the Lloyd's register from 1800 to 1840, and there is no ship with this name. So it's still a riddle that we have to solve. Which ship is it? But for you, interesting maybe is that we were able to image the ship outline with electromagnetic induction in the tidal flats. So that works quite well. But we also need something to be used with water on top of these wrecks. So this is maybe research for the future that we can do or others can do. We'll see. So we have a poor state of preservation that might and uh, leave us with a low contrast of the wooden structures. 
So uh, we can use conductivity. There is contrast in conductivity and magnetic susceptibility in water saturated wood. Um, but um, yeah, the deeper prospection relies on seismics in terms of racks. We have to use seismics and it's a good method. So there is technical work on EMI maybe underwater magnetics is still something that is being used for open source, but single channel. So there must be a multi-channel system somewhere in the future. There is a lot of technical open space, let's say, for guys like us in the geophysics. And the rule of using multiple geophysical methods to deal with the lack of contrast also applies for the marine prospection. That's what I wanted to emphasize with these examples. I have one example that uh, Imo might remember. I don't know if you have uh, witnessed this, uh, this measurements. There is a lake in northern Schleswig-Holstein, and this lake is around castle, a nice castle from the, I think, 18th century. And submerged in the lake is a monastery from the Middle Ages. And this lake was dried for a few days, and my colleagues were able in the 19, end of 1990s to investigate this um, monastery with GPR here. You see the walls coming out nicely and magnetometry as well. Also walls very nicely was visible. And then the lake was filled up again. So that is a good chance for us to use the 3D system and see whether we can image this with seismics as well. And the answer is no. There's only a reflection gap where the monastery, where the church is, and I still have no idea why it is so. So there are open questions. It is a matter of material. Maybe there are no wall remains, but simply channels. And with the, uh, with the water saturation coming back to 100%, again, it's no reflection coefficient left for seismics. So it's not always a solution. We have to deal with multiple geophysical methods. And uh, that's my conclusion for the ship and seismic prospection. One last example, a few of you know from the ICAP conference, but I had to add it here. There are examples where you have too much contrast. And we try to image a second World War heavy cruiser, the Admiral Scheer, which is buried in the old Navy Harbor of Kiel. It's here, it's now silted up. And we were um, facing the problem of imaging something from two to 12 meters depth. And that is made of steel. And that's a problem for most of the common geophysical methods. GPR didn't penetrate deep enough. ERT doesn't have enough resolution. Magnetometry simply has one large blob because it's steel, no matter if you use gradiometry or single channel. So we use blend seismics, which usually have a poor resolution. Uh, so we used SH hammer blow seismics. We went over this rack as far as we could go, which is this part of the wreck, imaged it and then used the data uh, in a way we use it in GPR, doing time slices. And you also end up with a 3D cube. Here's the tilted wreck of the heavy cruiser and this is the seismic reflection image. So there are reflections coming from the wreck itself. And if you image it in 3D, you end up with this. It's not a nice, nicely resolved, steel cruiser, but you see some details. You see the turret, the command turret of the ship. You see some remains that probably are the gun turrets, which are still in this harbor basin. So there is also an example of too much contrast. But this is just uh, something I needed to show you because it's a very, uh, yeah, one of my beloved small projects that I did the last year. Okay. Leaving the ships, coming to harbors and waterways uh, for the next few examples. Um, the problem of harbor prospection, which we dealt with uh, a long time, is that you have to ask what is a harbor, what makes a harbor. And what makes a harbor is not only just the ships, we talked about that a lot now, it is waterway infrastructure pile constructions, jetties, or stuff like that. That's what we have in mind. Even stone constructions in the, in the, in the archaic and uh, antique world. But we also have coastal sediments. They can also be part of a harbor because you have um, 
working areas, construction areas, you have a craftsmanship all connected to waterways, trade and harbors. So the coastal settlement is important. We know how to deal with that. The waterway infrastructure is important, but also the waters and the waterway themselves. So what we need is to reconstruct the paleo landscape and the coastline. We need to know where the water was to show where the harbor was. And sometimes harbors are not what we expect them to be, what we have in mind. So we have to check first close to coast settlements and network transport networks, harbor structures, ships. That's what we do with mapping methods. And we also have to check for the coastline reconstruction, river bay or bay stratigraphy, dried out riverbeds. And this is usually done by geophysical depth resolving methods, but in wetlands, giving us some problems. So we need the background landscape because most of the harbors are like this simply mooring sites. And the only answer that we have from a geophysical point of view is to reconstruct where the water was, where a ship could have been moored, was moored. Only a few harbors look like this. This is the reconstruction of Hedeby Harbor. So what are the available geophysical methods for all this? If we go on the left-hand side, which is the marine prospection, because we nowadays have water on top, we have the high-resolution marine seismics, we have the acoustics, multi-beam, side-scan sonar to image objects in the water column. And uh, for the coastline reconstruction, we have the same methods. The seismics, the marine seismics, have a very high penetration because it has a low damping. So we get both small objects and the stratigraphy, which is a good thing. On the right-hand side, it looks a bit worse because we are in coastal areas, lagoonal, swampy, very moisturous environments. So we usually have gradiometry, GPR, EMI, and ERT for coastal settlements, but the penetration is very low. Uh, we also have seismics, ERT, GPR, EMI, and coring for these landscape reconstruction things. So these are the problems. The problems with marine seismics is that we have multiples, so reverberations of the water columns up and down and up and down. These usually intersect with the ar archaeological features that we want to image, and then we need to get rid of them. Next is the accessibility. Small waterways, small waters, small rivers, small lakes usually are not uh, well in the vicinity of a jetty or a modern harbor where you can land your boat put it to the water. So we need to carry our stuff to all the archaeological interesting places, yes. which is a technical issue. And as I showed with the ship examples, we have a lack of contrast and a lack of methods in the submarine environment. The next problems are the accessibility on the land side as well. We have lagoons, swamps, tidal flats, salt marshes. It's hard to walk. It's hard to bring things there. It's difficult to use a quad doing large-scale prospection. It's not possible. So this is also a technical issue that we have in these coastal areas. And then we have a lack of penetration due to the high water content. So what we can do is use ERT and seismics where we usually use GPR. GPR is not penetrating anymore because it's very wet. But seismics and ERT have a low resolution on land and maybe a lack of contrast. So we have to deal with these problems. And these points one to five, I will go through quite briefly and then end up with a few examples concerning these features. So first point, accessibility of harbor areas. We have a few examples here. This is Carne Bay. This is the Lagoon of Ainos. Very hard to access. You see here an ERT line on the dry part of this lagoon. Um, most places look like this. You have vegetation uh, on the coast. You can't bring any ships there. Not huge instruments. So the solution to this is make things handy and lightweight. That's why our system looks like from Lego or Playmobil. It's uh, colorful, it's small, and it's also very tight using it. Yeah, it's, it's not very comfortable to sit in here 
for a few hours. But a good thing is we can carry it with two persons, getting it everywhere we want. The same accounts for multi-beam system that we use and the side scan sonar, we have a small inflatable catamaran. So you have these light, windy uh, and handy systems that you need to use for um, these small waters and waterways. That's one solution. The next problem was the multiple problem. So these water column reverberations, this of course is a theoretical issue and an issue of um, uh, processing of the data. I have an example from the North Sea, water column was about two meters. And then you have a multiple here crossing the archeology, span which is this one, this is an imprint of an old dike. And one of our um, uh, PhD students did a good job. It was Michaela Schwart in 2021 um, to reduce these multiples using a forward modeling technique, predicting multiples, and then simply subtract them from the data. This is one of the solutions that you can use for getting rid of these shallow water multiples. So there are solutions for all these problems that I've mentioned. And uh, yeah, coming to point two, the very shallow coastal part, you have to adapt your equipment carriers to be able to access them. Those were the solutions that we found. There are some other solutions by others, but uh, I simply picked ours. We have a, well, moon rover for the tidal flats doing magnetic radiometry. We have the same boat that we use for seismics, used for shallow marine radio radiometry here. For um, yeah, these swampy areas, we have a sled for radiometry, which can also be used on ice. So those were all the ideas that we tried out to get uh, this coastal part covered with geophysics. Um, you shouldn't talk to natural reserve guys using this <laughs> because you flatten the whole coastal area. <clears throat> yeah. So point three is the lack of penetration that I mentioned as a problem. This example I always show in my in my archaeogeophysics lecture. It's an ERT profile on the bottom and a GPR profile on top. And uh, it's a coastal area, of course. This is a beach area. And then you go into the moisture, yeah, not fully saturated, but quite saturated area of the of the water. And of course, the uh, resistivity is going down here just the blue part and you see that the penetration of GPR is simply zero. And that's that's why GPR is not working and ERT is not an alternative. I have uh, seen so many examples of ERT profiles in archeological prospection and a few of them were convincing. I selected this example of a wetland prospection. This is the Fossa Carolina, the Kaltzgraben in Bavaria and the ERT image of that uh, and the GPR image wetland. Not very convincing. So what can we do? We can use seismics, of course, and that's what we did for a few years. Um, we adapted and invented some land seismic methods, uh, scaled them down to get archaeological features imaged even in wetlands. There are two examples. Here we have a resonance analysis of seismic surface waves. We simply knocked on the ground and listen to what frequency comes back. And that's a map of it, simply said. So uh, the Viking Age pit house here is imaged with this method as well. Of course, it's time consuming. Yeah. Imaging this takes you two minutes. Imaging this takes you half a day. But if you have no method working and you have a strip of coastal area that you want to prospect, you need to do this because you have no other chance. So you have to take your time and do some seismics. Here's simply refraction seismics to image the depth of this pit, of the pit house. It's the same house, but a different seismic method. So it's it's worth using it. It has the resolution if you do some processing steps more than the usuals, and you are able to image archeological features, even with a bit more information. So you see the clay walls of the pit house and the seismics, which are not visible in the magnetics. So this would work in smaller areas and uh, we also did seismic full waveform inversion, which is a method that's not using only travel times, but also the amplitudes of the seismic wave. And you are able to get a sub wavelength resolution. And I chose again the Fossa Carolina, shown here, it's here connecting the Danube system with the Rhine system, or that was the idea of uh, 
Charlemagne to, to get this connected. He never finished, as we found out, but he did a part of the channel in Bavaria looking like this. This is the excavation of one half of it. Uh, you have seen the ERT example, the GPR example, and this is the seismic full waveform example. So you can see the sublayering in the seismics, which was kind of surprising to us that we were able to use seismics on this. But it takes you for one profile half a day. Yeah. With uh, geophones mounted every 25 centimeters. It takes you a long time, but you can get information out of it. Another example from uh, INOS, um, which is also done by was also done by Michaela Schwart in 2020, and she was able to use seismic full waveform inversion imaging very very slight differences in sediments. Uh, this is from gray clay silt to light gray sand to brown loamy silt. It is something that you have problems using your eyes and distinguish it. And the seismics were able to, to get the contrast of that. So this is useful, but takes some time. Another solution would be to enhance the resolution of ERT inversions. And my colleague Tina Wunderlich tried this using direct push EC locks, um, introducing constraints to the ERT inversion, getting a bit more resolution on the layering of this uh, example. This is from Ostia Antica. Uh, this is the, the harbor bay of Ostia. So these things are also working and are quite promising, but also time consuming. Okay, those were the solutions that are available so far. There might, might be more, but uh, we haven't stumbled upon them yet. And now I show you some examples at the end of the harbors, waterway infrastructure, coastal settlements, and so on and so on. Coming back to Putsk, where we have seen the uh, the known wreck, which we use for ground truthing for our 3D system. And here is an example of one larger part of this harbor bay. So here are, here's the uh, Yacht Club. I don't know how to say in English in Putsk. And, uh, this is an area we covered with a multi-beam system, the Norbit system. And this is one part of it. You see a uh, pile construction, a bridge here as reflection points in the multi-beam, which is a quite nice example. And do you see these weird lines here and some uh, elevation underwater and another line? So those are all ditches and constructions, piles, constructions of this long-used Slavic harbor of Putsk. It's a huge system of everything you want. And if you use 3D seismic and look into the ground, Using this part here, you end up with this. It's a bunch of ships. I have no idea what used, uh, what they were used for. I have no idea if they simply ended up there, if they were used to construct something in terms of, of harbor construction. But there's S, one, two, three, four, five, six ships together. And um, Still no diver was there, so it's an open question what it was used for. Um, we hope that we come back someday to this spot and uh, get something more. There was a there was a publication by the Polish colleagues who also did multi-beam and Inuma data that came out, I think, two years ago or so. Um, unfortunately, they did another area with no ships. So there is a lot of data available from this harbor site, and it's very interesting because you have the small features, you have the piles, you have everything, and a lot of that is known, a lot of that is covered by multi-beam, and it's a playground for everything you want to test in geophysics. Um, next example, also Slavic, a bit more to the west. It's the uh, harbor and settlement of Rerik that was already measured in the 1990s by Harald Stümpel and colleagues, and there's a lot of mag magnetometry done here. You have a lot of pits. Because it's early medieval, the remains visible are like, well, pits. That's it. And uh, we also did a mirror area over here with the 16-channel Mahler system. And there are some more details coming out. Here's a possible ship burial with the cross-section here. It was never excavated. Um, so. Uh, Things are open here, but 
I wanted to show this example is because we did marine magnetic magnetometry here. This you remember this boat that can be pushed in shallow water with the four uh, first probes in front. Because the idea of the archaeological colleagues was that this in the aerial picture visible nose of a waterway is the harbor, the former. And if you follow it, you can see it here. This is the uh, the nose of the harbor, this one. And then we did the marine magnetometry and we ended up with this image. More pits underwater. So probably no harbor at that time. So these are the, the things that you can image. It's, it's very time consuming and you have a lot of gaps because you can't really uh, maneuver with this boat when wind is coming and waves are coming. It's a bit difficult, but things are um, yeah, helpful that you can image with this. And you can reconstruct uh, the old settlement into the water, enlarging it, reshaping the possible harbor, also getting the old dunes in the magnetics here, and so on and so on. So this is um, quite interesting and useful to use magnetometry also in shallow waters. The next example is the North Harbor of Igaliku. Igaliku is on Greenland, the southern tip of Greenland here. And uh, Eric the Red ended up somewhere here, and his daughter ended up here, marrying a guy who wasn't that wealthy, but they founded a village. And this village uh, was said to have a harbor. And later on, during the Christian times of the Vikings, there was a bishop's seat in this small village. So if you, if you were a bishop, in the medieval times and the Viking Age times, and you did something wrong, you probably ended up in Igaliku on Greenland. So uh, the idea was to check whether we can find a harbor, and a harbor for the Vikings means a sheltered area in these small villages. Not the Hedeby Harbor, but a mooring site that is sheltered to keep your boat safe from, from the weather. And what you see nowadays here are remains of buildings made of stone because that's the only material available in Greenland. There's only a few wood available also back in the times of the Vikings. You have a small insula, a small island here with a warehouse on top, a Viking Age warehouse. And the question was whether we can reconstruct the Viking Age coastline and whether this island, today's island, was a peninsula back in the time of the Vikings. So we did a large uh, bathymetric survey and because traveling to Iceland was so difficult, yeah, accessibility only by plane, we can't, we couldn't bring a multi-beam system and a large frame to carry it. We needed to bring simply a two-channel seismic and a side scan sonar. That was something that cost costed us fifteen thousand euros bringing it there by plane. Um, but we ended up with this nice uh, bathymetric map, and we could show using cores from a diff from uh, the adjacent fjord, um, how the Viking coastline looked like. This is the black line during low tide, so that was a peninsula, and this is during high tide, also accessible by foot. Um, ships can come around here, are sheltered, unload their stuff to the warehouse, and then people can bring it to the main village. There was also something cracked out of this peninsula. You can see it here in the bathymetric map, something you can move your ship in. So quite nice example of a mooring place, a sheltered mooring place. And we were able to help a bit in reconstructing the coastline with geophysics. And this is the reconstruction um, that was made after our measurements. Um, this is the warehouse. This is yeah, a boat. They, unfortunately, they forgot the small spot where you can put the boat in. Next example, Ostia Antica. I've chose that example because it has harbor constructions and constructions. Ostia was the first harbor of Rome. Here was Rome, here is Ostia. This is Tiber, uh, the Tiber River. And the Tiber runs here, and the harbor was kind of this shape here. And is now a lagoon silted up, so we had no choice. Very uh, conductive material, no GPR was working in the lagoon, but on the edges. So we did this, this part, uh, GPR measurements, here are time slices, you see uh, 
constructions on the edge of the harbor bay. Inside the harbor bay, we were well limited to ERT and seismics. So what we did is ERT trying to reconstruct the lagoonal harbor. The old one, it had two phases. We have, a, we have coring made by the colleagues from Mainz, Andreas Fürth's group. Yeah, but ERT. So we used seismics and uh, in addition, the seismics were able to image this high velocity shear wave layer, which corresponds to a high energy flooding event. So it's also a matter of um, what happened to a harbor to reconstruct it. So there are two phases. There is an old harbor bay. Then there was this high energy flooding event. You have force material coming in with a high shear wave velocity contrast imaged by seismics. And then you have the younger harbor, the fluvial harbor that was later used. And then that, the whole harbor moved to the north because it needs to be abandoned. Imu, you mentioned that, the harbor of Kane. This is also an example of seismic measurements and uh, bathymetric results. So we have the, the symmetry of uh, a bay. We are here in Turkey, close to Bergama. And this harbor was mentioned uh, having a Roman fleet anchoring there for a few times. And um, yeah, the bathymetry showed us the harbor bay. It's here. It's sheltered behind a breakwater. The breakwater was made of large bricks. You can see the bricks on the surface in the seismic uh, data. You can see through the breakwater in the seismic data. This is the base of it. You can image the sand layers in the bay. So you have everything you want in the seismics and are, you are able to uh, well interpret this data having a harbor bay, having walls inside, having the breakwater and stuff like that. That was very easy. An easy example of a reconstructed harbor. The next, now we're coming to Germany. Again, Roman, this is the um, Roman uh, horse fortress, Boginatium, uh, at an old Rhine river arm. You can see it in the topography here. So this is all land today. There has been done, there has been done a lot of magnetometry. Here you can see the camp quite well. And then you have this strange edge of the camp. Usually Roman camps are like playing cards. They have no strange edges. So the idea was if this edge needed to be adapted because of the moving river. Those are the questions that we deal with and that we can deal with using land methods like seismics and ERT. So we have the seismic measurement, land seismic measurement here. We can reconstruct the old riverbed, even see which side of the river we have yeah, now, it's, now I have the, uh, don't have the right English word for Gleithang and Prallhang. But you might know what I'm talking about, where the water is crushing into the side and where the water is simply flowing around. So these are meanders going around and uh, you can distinguish the two sides. And this one was eroded here, this part of the camp. And then later on used as a harbor, as you can see here in GPR, there we had freshwater conditions, GPR was penetrating a bit, and we can uh, could image a few harbor structures here, pile objects vertical to this weird edge of the Roman camp. And one of the few, well, best examples, let's say uh, a very new data, this is unpublished so far. Our PhD student, Sarah Bäumler, was in, uh, at the DGG conference last week presenting it for the first time. We did this together with, uh, with a working group of Andreas Fett again from Mainz. They're doing the geoarchaeology. And uh, we are in Olympia, ancient Olympia. Every time I tell people I work in Olympia, they ask me, okay, what sports are you doing? But no, it's ancient Olympia. It's the old... Uh, sanctuary of Olympia, and you can see it here in the background. Temple of Zeus, Her the Heraion. Here's the stadium. Here's the Leonidion, the guest house of Olympia. And we were allowed to measure right outside the fence of the sanctuary. They didn't let us into the fences, but outside the fence was fine. And the problem with Olympia is that you have two rivers coming down. It's the Cladeus, and down here is the Alphaios, not visible on this image. And those rivers are bringing a lot of sediments. So the whole site and also the 
excavated part of it were covered by up to four, five meters of sediments. And then people are coming to you and say, you're a geophysicist. Wouldn't you try and image something underneath four and five meters of sediments? And you say, well, well, that's not our usual depth that we are working with. So what we did is also seismics, ERT, you can see examples here, but also again, EMI. So we used the large EMI device from GF Instruments, the four and a half meter pipe carried. And uh, it was, was a, a lot of work through all the olive trees. I was all the time brushing the device on the olive trees, but we ended up with a map. And the interesting thing in this EMI conductivity map is that we actually see something very interesting. And I'm not allowed to call it in any way yet, because the data from mines is still work in progress. But the colleagues from mines were able to reconstruct the so-called Lake of Olympia. They have 150 corings and were able to show that Olympia was situated on the edge of a lake. And now the EMI data, data shows us a basin, a high conductive basin in the same direction as the buildings of the sanctuary facing the lake. I will leave that open to you. And as well, we have a wall here that is called the Cladeus wall because uh, they had the problem in uh, ancient times as well with the sediments coming down from the mountains. So they had to kind of direct where the Cladeus river is going. So they built a wall, this Cladeus wall, and it's visible here in the, in the EMI as well. So this is one of our um, examples from the last years, and we are hoping to publish that this year, finishing the work with all the core rings and together with the colleagues from Mainz. Back to the Romans, another example from a running project, the so-called Landgraben projects. We are in the Rhine floodplain in Hessia in Germany, and the Romans did an artificial, well, water system. They built an artificial water system to connect the uh, Palio Neca with the Rhine system. Going here, and we are here investigating a uh, so-called Burgus, which is a harbor site, uh, uh, yeah, not sheltered, but um, protected harbor site. So the harbor is in between those two turrets here, those two towers, and you have a main building and these wing walls and uh, because magnetometry is not working in these uh, areas, because there is no contrast, we use again EMI imaging this nice bogus here, and we're able to reconstruct the old Landgraben, very straight um, ditch and waterway connected to this bogus. So this image is quite nice because um, it shows how you can use EMI data to firstly image archaeology, and the surrounding landscape. And then you are able to interpret archaeology together with the landscape. So you have an old Rhine terrace here, which is the high resistive, uh, high conductive part here. So sand on top of this is the Burgos. And then you have the Landgraben coming up here. So this also was together with the colleagues from Mainz. We're working a lot with those guys. And uh, they also did a lot of corings and confirmed this this Landgraben part, and I think this one doesn't need to be confirmed. And finally, we come to Rungholt. Rungholt was our, well, yeah, most famous site the last years. Few of you uh, have already seen that or have visited and helped. Clara was there helping. And uh, so we are somewhere here in the tidal flats of the North Sea around a tidal island called Südfall, where two weird persons are living on. <clears throat> and <laughs> we investigated this part because there have been fine surface finds by archaeologists and, and private guys walking around, and they were recorded. And time by time, when the floods go back and forth, you can see things like ditches and remains in aerial pictures. So we are working there now since about eight years. And it's a vast area. And when I, when I talked to Imo first time about that, he said, you can go with a quad there. And I said, no, sorry, we're not allowed 
because of natural heritage problems. And I, we talked a lot to those guys and um, they said, everything you can do that can be seen by tourists and redone, you're not allowed to. So we can't go there by bike. We can't go there by quad or whatever device you can use to carry your stuff. So we have to use our, we have to carry our equipment a few kilometers in the tidal flats, do some measurements and then go back before the flood is coming. And the question behind all this is that in 1362, a large storm came from the southwest crossing England, leaving a lot of damage in England as well and in Belgium, over the Netherlands to North Frisia over here, carrying a large storm flood. And this whole area was inhabited. Thousands of people were living there due to the records, based on the records, and they were all drowned. So the whole landscape was drowned, and now it looks like this. And the good thing is, this example is one of the examples where you can do both. During high tide, you can use seismics from the boat with your good resolution. And at low tide, you can do magnetometry and whatever you would like to do, like EMI, whatever works in the tidal flats. And we ended up with a large map of remains, of archaeological remains from... Uh, 1362. Here's again the Südfall Island, and here are some examples. Here's a drawing of the of the settlement as con reconstructed so far by means of magnetometry and by archaeological work. And at this stage, I have to say that this is a huge project. I'm not doing this alone. We are together with archaeologists from the ZBSA and the Leitza as well from Mainz and Schleswig. This is Ruth Blankenfeld. We have again the working group of Andreas Fött. Hannah Hadler is head of this part of the project doing the corings. We're doing the geophysics. We are funded by the GF, DFG and the cluster in Kiel. So there's a lot of stuff going on. We had uh, some uh, student courses there. And we ended up finally with this map. And you see here so-called dwar um, dwarfs, uh, Barften, sorry, dwelling mounds in English. So mounds where people built their farms on top to be sheltered or secure from the storm floods. You have the drainage ditches here. You have some probably gardens, whatever. We have no idea what that is. Um, you have that also in other areas, but a bit less contrast, like over here. These are these dwelling mounds and the drainage ditches, and they are all redrawn by my colleague Ben Temaychuk, who is also online here, I think, um, listening to that talk. And you can follow these drainage directions and reconstruct these so-called elongated Hufendörfer. And because I'm talking about methodology, it's not about... Um, <clears throat> not about magnetometry alone. We also did seismics on high tide, and you can actually see um, what is going on in the ground. Most of the stuff is eroded, and what, you, what we have left behind is a layer of pre-medieval marshland, which has a contrast in magnetic susceptibility, which was pressed down by the load of the dwelling mounds and the dikes that were built. So you have the marsh, which has the, marsh which has the signal. This was pressed down then recovered, and then the rest on top was eroded. So what you see here is the imprint of the former dwelling mound in the magnetic, uh, as the magnetic anomaly. So this is the old pre-medieval uh, marsh that is uh, visible there. So no remains left, or nearly no remains left, only a bit of turf. And you can see it in the seismics. This is a cross section through the dike. The dike is down here. In this example, the profile is somewhere here, crossing here, and this is the imprint of the dike. And then you have the erosional contact of a modern tidal creek. This is all you see in the magnetics, and it's not, not much. It's plus minus one nanotesla. It's only a, only a bit left there. And last year, and this is the first time I'm showing that in a talk, we discovered in the center of all this the church of the settlement called Rungholt. And uh, of course, by accident, the area is so, so huge. You walk and walk and walk and do some magnetic maps. And by accident, you find these things. And I was emphasizing on this plus minus one nanotesla because these anomalies in the magnetometry, they are 
about 300 nanotesla. So that tells us there is something in there which um, gives us a large signal. And we measured magnetometry as well as EMI with a mini explorer and you end up with a nice, well, kind of a building. On the western part you have large foundations, on the eastern part you have roundish foundations, and if you compare that to a church which is still standing on land in Breklum in Schleswig-Holstein, which is also one of the main churches of the old um, districts of that time, you end up with this comparison. So this uh, confirms quite nicely that we have a church building. It's not small. This is uh, 40 meters in length and 15 in width. So this is something that they built out there for, for a certain reason. Um, being a main church of a, um, yeah, of a district of very large... Um, a very large area. Here's a reconstruction that I've made from this church based on the on the known churches. This is how it looked like. Uh, probably some adjacent buildings which are no longer visible in magnetometry. And we also did a profile together with the colleagues from Mainz using the EMI. And the EMI enables us to look in a vertical section because we can do the inversion. And what you see here is not a typical profile. It goes like this, this, and this, because we had to follow the corings that my colleague Hannah was doing for the Mainz group. The corings are in here, and this is an inversion of the EMI conductivity, where you have the left foundation here, which is visible in, uh, as well as, uh, in the conductivity as well as in the susceptibility inversion. So we had to calibrate the EMI using core rings and measuring susceptibility. After it was calibrated, we were able to invert data. Getting cross-section in an area uh, where we usually can't do that. You can't use GPR here. ERT doesn't have the, a good resolution, sufficient resolution, so you rely on EMI to get vertical cross-sections. And that worked quite well. You have the construction part over here as an anomaly in susceptibility. Um, we were very happy about that. We submitted that recently. Um, so it will be published, hopefully, depending on the reviewers. I have no idea. Still waiting for that. Um, but yeah, after eight years of walking in tidal flats, you accidentally stumble upon such a nice building, which is a good thing. And uh, we were very happy having that. And last but not least, oh, I'm a bit over time, I guess. Sorry for that. Um, because you are working on um, pile dwellings, um, two weeks ago I've been to Poland in uh, Komorowo, which is near Poznan, and they have in the uh, topographic map a very nice fortified settlement and one of an island in a larger lake. And this settlement is called a Biskupin type fortified settlement because the site of Biskupin is quite famous in Poland and also out of Poland. It's a uh, Bronze Age fortified settlement looking like this. And the colleagues were not looking for the settlement. This is boring, of course. We need to look for these kind of constructions, bridges, uh, pile dwellings around the island, something like that. So we went there quite recently using side scan sonar covering this area and then trying to use 3D seismics to cover these parts, getting the maybe bridges. So this is quite recent and I wanted to show that because I would like to discuss it with you guys um, concerning how piles actually should look like in side scan sonar. We have this example uh, on one of the edges of the First island, you have the side scan sonar shadow in, in white here, not white, but in, in light colors, and you have the dark dots. You have a few lines of these features coming out here. So there are some candidates. There will be divers going there in April checking this, and then we are a bit further on that. So there are promising features, but in the seismics, you remember the tree that I shown you? The tree was here, and the tree somehow ended there, and we will asking us why is there a tree in a six meter depth? So probably people tried to get the tree from the island and the tree somehow ended up in the middle of nowhere in the lake because it got stuck. That's our idea. 
And it got stuck because you have a lot of piles and the construction going in this narrow part from the mainland to the island. So this is the candidate for a bridge in, this, in the 3D seismics. Looks quite promising. And this is the most recent example I can show you for coastal features in uh, geophysical prospection. And there was a lot. I hope I didn't bore you too much. So my conclusion and summary is a bunch of images for you to recall what I've shown you, examples from Roman Burgos seismic measurements to submerged pits and the bunch of ships in Poland using all these methods, the lightweight and handy stuff, and even Malamira, which is quite common, which we all know. And uh, I've talked a lot about shipwrecks and resolution. Maybe you can keep that in mind. Um, that would be would be nice thing, a nice thing. And uh, of course, I talked about other possibilities and submarine prospections, which are, which are part of research, which are part of technical research, of technical construction. So there need to be ideas beyond seismics and submarine prospection. And that's something which I wanted to say a lot. Um, yeah, here's the literature. I need to go through because uh, otherwise I, I'm not allowed to show all the images. These are the papers. As this is recorded, you can look them, look at them afterwards. And with this slide, I would say thank you. This is a um, the view to Rungholt nowadays or last year, and this is how it looked like after our measurements, the reconstruction of Rungholt in the year 1362. Of course, before the flood. Thank you for your